Thanks for joining us in our course on understanding medications. In this lesson, we're going to learn about the general mechanisms by which our medications affect neurotransmissions. And the way in which we're going to approach that is by first reviewing the steps that are involved in neurotransmission and then by placing the medications mechanisms in the context of those steps. So very simplistically, when a nerve gets excited or depolarizes, there's an electrical impulse that travels down the neuron to the far end of the neuron, and that's called the end terminal. And at that point, we need to transmit that signal to the next neuron. But most of the neurons, the electrical impulse is not able to just go into the next neuron. What we do in most neurons is that we use a chemical messenger called neurotransmitters. And those chemicals are packed up into secretory vesicles. Vesicles are little balls of the agent, the neurotransmitter. And as the electrical impulse comes down to those vesicles, what that is doing is instructing the vesicles to fuse onto the end terminal and as it fuses onto the end terminal the neurotransmitters are going to be released into the synaptic cleft. So now we have a bunch of neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft and note that those two neurons here they're not actually touching. There's an incredibly small distance for diffusion of the neurotransmitters. So the neurotransmitters don't take hardly any time at all, a matter of just a few milliseconds or a few thousandths of a second in order to get from the one uh, cell to the next and, and uh, latch onto the receptor. When that happens, the effect on this next cell is determined by whether that neurotransmitter that's released is an excitatory neurotransmitter or whether it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. If it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, it's going to bring that second cell closer to what we call depolarization. And what that means, it's going to be more likely that that electrical impulse is going to start down that second cell. If it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, it's going to make it less likely that that depolarization will occur. And when you imagine this, you need to keep a number of things in mind. Firstly, we cannot just change the strength of the message to the second neuron. So how is it that we change the impact to the second neuron? Well, the way that we do that is to adjust the frequency of the impulses that go to the second neuron. So we can have it very infrequent, so very infrequent, or very, very frequently. Another thing to remember is that you have to be able to degrade that neurotransmitter almost immediately. You think about it. If you had a peripheral nerve that was going over to the muscles of the hands and it was instructing the muscles of the hands, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine was instructing the muscles of the hand to contract, if you weren't able to degrade that acetylcholine down really, really quickly, then your muscle in your hand would be constantly contracted. For the respiratory system, you know, you need to be able to relax, contract, relax, and contract. You have to have those degraded really, really quickly. So how are we going to degrade the neurotransmitter down at the synaptic cleft? Two ways. We have a enzyme that's there that's going to be able to degrade that very quickly. And then uh, a second mechanism is that we have a reuptake kind of pump that pumps it back into the neurotransmitters, it pumps the neurotransmitters back into the first neuron. And all of that happens within a few milliseconds. So now that we've taken that and we've got a picture of that in our mind, let's take a look at the drugs, the, the general mechanisms by which our drugs act. Well, there's a number of ways. The first one is an antagonist. We can actually take a drug that binds to that receptor on the second neuron and prevents the neurotransmitters to bind onto that receptor. That's an antagonist. A second way is to have an agonist. It would bind to that same receptor 
and it would cause the same physiological response as the natural neurotransmitter would. Another way is to have that enzyme affect that enzyme that's in that synaptic cleft. And the way we would do that is we would inhibit that enzyme. If we inhibited that enzyme that actually breaks down the neurotransmitter, we would end up with the neurotransmitter being in the synaptic cleft longer. And then another thing that winds up in the neurotransmitter being in the synaptic cleft longer is to affect the reuptake pump. Remember that pump that kind of pulls the neurotransmitters back into the original cell. Okay, so now what we're going to do is take a few examples of that in the next couple lessons, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Let's apply our knowledge of the general ways that our drugs work on neurons by hypothesizing about how antidepressants would work. It's widely accepted that depression occurs due to a decrease in the neurotransmitters serotonin and or noradrenaline in the areas of the brain that are associated with mood. So there is a shortage of serotonin or noradrenaline. Hypothesize on the ways in which our antidepressants could work. A, we could administer an agent that could inhibit this enzyme in the synaptic cleft that breaks down serotonin and or noradrenaline. B, we could administer an agent that decreases the reuptake of the serotonin and or the noradrenaline in this synaptic cleft. Or C, both of the above would potentially give the desired effect. And you were correct if your answer was C both of the above would potentially give the desired effect. We have medications that are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, which inhibit this enzyme in the synaptic cleft. By inhibiting the degradation of serotonin, there's an increase in the amount of serotonin binding to the receptors on the second cell. We also have other antidepressants like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that decrease this reuptake of the serotonin into this first neuron. And with that, there's once again more serotonin in the synaptic cleft ready to bind onto the receptors of the second neuron. The prescriber would just need to choose the one that had the least side effects and most benefits for the specific person being treated. Understanding medications that work on neurotransmission is one of the most difficult areas of pharmacology. But if you understand the imbalance that has occurred and the neurotransmitters involved, you're much closer to being able to conquer an understanding of the drugs that work on neurons. For emesis, it's complicated on one hand by the fact that there's four separate pathways for emesis. But on the other hand, it's much less complicated because of the fact that most of our anti-emetic drugs are receptor antagonists for a particular neurotransmitter. Simplistically speaking, when we feel nauseous, our vomiting center is getting too many messages in the form of neurotransmitters. So most of our antiemetics will block the neurotransmitter that is involved. And most of our side effects will come from the binding of that medication in an area of the body or brain that we don't want it to affect. We'll get a really good picture of that in a moment. But in the next lesson, we'll make sure that you understand the safety issues of the presenting complaints, so the safety issues associated with vomiting.